thanks for all of you who are part of this uh, really tremendous effort. You know, I think one of the things that strikes me just from the conversation so far this morning is what a complex disease that uveal melanoma is. And there are so many different aspects of this disease from the beginning with making the diagnosis and assessing the different treatment options to then those later phases of the disease Dr. Hovland uh, alluded to once the initial crisis is over and we're managing things downstream in terms of assessing risk that the tumor may go somewhere else in the body. Um, for those who've kept their eye for trying to preserve that eye or trying to preserve vision, um, and I think between the three of us, we probably could stand up here all day long just to talk about the ocular aspects. And I'm glad that we'll hear about some of the other systemic aspects uh, later in the day. Um, Sarah asked me to talk about the phase of care that happens after eye treatment. Um, and Ken and Peter, thanks for great introductions to this disease and to um, how we get people launched on trying to take care of it. Um, Whenever we give a talk at the U, um, and for most of us in academics, we always like people to know sort of what they're getting into. There are no FDA approved treatments for this disease. So everything that we're talking about is off label. Uh, it is the nature of this rare disease. I serve on the advisory board for Castle Biosciences, which is one of the companies that provides prognostic information. I also receive clinical trial support through the University of Colorado for some of the medications that are discussed here. We have no clinical trials for medications that are used to treat radiation retinopathy, but we do use them off-label to treat radiation retinopathy, which I will talk about later. Taking care of uveal melanoma is a team effort. These are just some of the people who are involved in the care of our patients at CU. Um, I'm very grateful to each and every one of them, and I won't name them all individually. There's a lot that goes on behind the scenes in the care of your disease and um, of the other patients that we take care of. And basically, I'll explain to folks after we take all of the tests at the initial visit to try to assess what's going on and then decide upon treatment, that we have about 20 people that we have to arrange to be in the right place at the right time if we're doing brachytherapy, we need to have the device there at exactly the right day and the right time to get into the eye to treat the tumor. And this is not something that any single physician um, can take care of. So all of us are grateful for the effort of everyone uh, who contributes. In terms of the critical goals, as I look at this disease, they're listed here and in this priority order. We're trying to save life, we're trying to save the eye, and we are trying to save vision. As ophthalmologists, we think a whole lot about saving the eye and saving the vision. This is one of the only diseases in our field where saving life is also a critical priority. And you'll find that for those folks who take care of uveal melanoma around the country, and I gather that many of you have traveled from far and, and some much closer, um, there are not a lot of folks in the ophthalmology field who take care of this disease. Part of that is due to its rarity, Part of it is due to its complexity. Um, it's a challenging disease to take care of. For those of us who do do it, we're pretty passionate about it. We wouldn't be doing this unless we wanted to fix this problem. So I'll tell you a little bit about how we approach trying to address each of these three aspects of uveal melanoma. Both doctors Hovland talked about the COM study and the risk of death that comes with this disease. Now this data is old, but it's the best data set that we have and probably will ever have for taking care of uveal melanoma. This was an absolutely huge study. It was also a wildly expensive study. The NIH does not fund studies at this level anymore. So we will continue to use this data set as time goes on. The most significant result that came out of the COM study was the illustration or the, the proof that brachytherapy, that is radiation device implantation to save the eye, was equal to removing the eye in terms of risk of loss of life. The data from the COM study went out, you can see at the far right side of the study, 144 months. We don't get studies with 12 year highly detailed follow up anymore. This is really amazing. The thing that is so vexing about this disease is that these are patients who are treated. 
And we know that some people who have uveal melanoma do very well. They move on down the road. They may deal with issues related to their eye, but they're cured of the disease. And there are others who go on to develop metastases. That has been a very frustrating aspect of this disease to all of us, and I know it is to all of you. We're getting better at predicting who is at risk for spread of the disease. But even with some of the great tools that we have now, they still are very imperfect. And we have some folks who, frankly, I'm really worried about, who still do great, and we have other folks who may have a tiny little tumor. We think that may just be a freckle. And suddenly the thing starts to misbehave and we become more worried. So trying to solve this issue of the fact that the tumor can still do other problems, cause other problems in the body after it's treated is really the biggest unsolved challenge for uveal melanoma. One component of the COM study that's not mentioned very often which I bring up to all my residents and fellows, and I apologize if some of my studies have stats and a whole lot of detail, but I do use these for different audiences, was a small piece of the COM study amongst patients with medium-sized tumors who decided not to undergo treatment initially. So this is interesting. They were willing to enroll in a trial, but then said, you know what? I don't know about this radiation thing, and for that matter, I don't know about taking out my eye. Let's just see what happens. I still have those patients to this day. And Dr. Hovland's example of the 104-year-old gentleman who made the right call early on uh, illustrates the fact that probably not every one of uveal melanoma tumors needs to be treated. The problem is we don't know which one. And one of the questions that I get from astute patients is, does treating this do any good? Does this change my future? And to Pete's point, unfortunately, it depends. There are probably some tumors, in fact, I'm quite sure there are some tumors that could be observed that would not cause metastatic death. If we could predict which tumors those were, I would absolutely love to not treat them. There are some tumors that we know are at higher risk, and we know that they need to be treated. But at present time, at most centers in the country, nearly all tumors that have certain characteristics that are suggestive of transformation to melanoma still get treated. And I'm not aware of any centers that are deferring treatment yet based on some of the prognostic information. But what we gleaned from this small portion of this study, and you can see that some patients had tumors that grew and they went on to subsequently be treated, but it appears that their risk of death was indeed higher. So the gray bar here shows the data from the prior slide. This is patients in the COM study, and you can see that the errors of measurement are small in that study because there was a very large number of patients. We have far fewer patients in the initial observation portion, so the error bars are wider, and there's some degree of overlap, not tremendous statistical significance, but there's at least some suggestion that there are some patients whose lives are saved by treating the eye. What we think is happening there is that we are catching some patients who have the ocular diagnosis before the tumor gets out of the eye. So we know that many tumors are not smart enough to get out of the eye. I call these dumb tumors or low risk tumors or class one tumors. And I like dumb tumors and I want them all to be that way. But amongst those that are higher risk, the hypothesis is that some of them have already broken out and they've sent out spies. And those spies are just kind of hanging out not necessarily misbehaving, and they're too small to find. We know that our immune system plays a huge role, not only in ocular melanoma, but in cutaneous melanoma as well. In fact, probably every one of us in this room has had a melanoma develop somewhere in our body, and it's been eradicated by our immune system. It's only when a tumor develops mutations that allows it to fool our immune system that it can then put down roots and start to grow. I think the area where our local treatment of the eye is most effective is in these tumors that may be genetically high risk, that may be getting smart, where we are killing the tumor in the eye before it's able to get out. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with some of the genetic predictors of tumor spread. Throughout 
now many decades uh, of folks taking care of this disease, people have tried to ask, how do we predict a bad tumor or a good tumor, one to worry about and one not to worry about? And many, many, many papers have been written on that topic in terms of the location of the tumor, the size of the tumor, dimensions, both basal and, and uh, greatest linear dimensions. So those were all clinically descriptive characteristics. Then there was an era when pathologists were looking at the cells under the microscope to see if the cellular features, the observed cellular features, were a little different. And so that's where you may have heard about spindle cell tumors or epithelioid tumors. And then more recently now, some of the genetic aspects of this disease have become very prominent. And we know that loss of uh, some chromosomes or gain of other chromosomes, specifically loss of the third chromosome or gain of the eighth chromosome, looks to be a predictor for spread of the tumor. There now are two companies that are offering genetic testing of the tumor. And I saw that many of you have had predictive or prognostic testing. Not everyone chooses to get it. Not everyone is offered to have this prognostic information. In terms of the utility of the information, both tests provide, uh, in my view, very helpful information for those who want to know how worried do I need to be about this tumor. I have had patients who've thought this over and have said, I don't want to know how worried to be about this tumor. I'm already worried enough and I don't want one other layer of information or perhaps burden to deal with um, with this added information. At the present time, none of us changes our treatment based on the genetic results. So the genetic prognostication tells me how often am I going to recommend that this patient undergoes screening and surveillance if they are wishing to have more targeted surveillance. And for patients, I have many who do say, you know what, good news or bad news, I do want to know. Information gives me a little more sense of control for understanding this disease and knowing how much this is impacting my life. I think that there's value to these tests. I don't think that they are for everyone. Um, I will tell you that after treatment, I spend a lot of time talking about the results of these tests because we have them. And then we have to figure out what do we do with them. And then we get to a five-year time point. And in the case of the CASEL test, I run out of data. I don't know what happens to my CASEL patients after five years. Now that study was done more than five years ago, but we'll never get the 10-year data from that data set. And this is the reason that both of us are in the COOG-2 study. We're enrolling patients currently, some of you I'm sure are already participating, so that we can follow patients for a longer period of time with the CASEL diagnostics test, with PRAME, which is another tumor marker, so that we can generate 10-year data. The impact genetics gives us 10-year data. Then I have patients who were treated 15 years ago or 20 years ago, and they ask, am I done? When, when are you going to tell me that I'm done, or when do I have to not come back to you? And I don't take that personally, and I understand the question perfectly well. And what I say to all of my patients is, I don't know that we're ever totally done, but once we start getting out beyond a decade, I certainly feel lower risk about the whole situation. I think we still should stay in touch, and I do tend to follow patients on an ongoing basis because I don't have evidence that we should stop. For every person who's been affected by melanoma, we know that this will impact you personally for the rest of your life. Some reassurance, even when a person is years and years out, to know that the situation remains stable, I think still retains some value although it doesn't necessarily need to be too frequent. This is the quiz portion. This is uh, just to remind you that there will be a test. No, I'm kidding. Um, I don't test the residents or fellows on this either. This is a pathway map. This is some indication of progress in the field of cutaneous oncology to understanding the biology of how these tumors go down different paths. What we're starting to understand is that uveal melanoma is not actually a singular disease. There seems to be a single event that causes melanocytes, which every one of us has, it's part of the pigment of our skin and the pigment of our eyes, at some point those melanocytes aggregate and they'll form a freckle or they'll form a nevus, just like the ones that you get on your skin. That's a very, very upstream event. And I see, I don't even know, hundreds, it 
maybe thousands of nevi, totally benign, they behave themselves, nothing happens. Then something changes that causes them to progress, causes them to grow. It appears that as these nevi are transforming into melanomas, they may be developing a mutation that takes them down one path, or a different path, or a third path. And the names that are being used for those, and we think this is accurate, is a 1A or a 1B or a class 2 genetic expression type. And now some of those target mutations have been identified. Why do we care? Because these are the things to target. And I think Dr. Ryath will probably talk to us a little more about targeted therapy and kind of the scientific approach to trying to either treat metastatic disease or prevent it when we know someone's at high risk to dial that risk down. Mutational testing on fine needle biopsy specimens is available from both of the food companies that provide the, the commercially available tests. And that's just come online within the last year. So what happens after treatment? Well, surveillance. Now this is a big topic. There's a lot that we could talk about here. There have been, and I think there still are, a few ocular oncologists who say there's not a lot of value in surveillance. And I've had conversations with medical oncologists, one of whom just retired, which I think is probably good, who said, it, we don't have a great treatment for this disease, so why are we doing all these tests ahead of time? I find that very hard to accept. Many of you may as well. I know there's a huge amount of anxiety that happens when you go in for surveillance tests. My patients tell me they hold their breath they dread the day that they either come to see me or go have their surveillance tests. Because what if it's bad news? And that makes all the sense in the world. And so we talk that through to say, well, how often do we want to look? How often do you want to worry about this? And what will we do about it? Why, why do we bother with this? Well, we do have some evidence that if metastases are detected when they're small or when they're singular, that there's a better chance of prolonging life with targeted therapy. The number of patients who are detected with solitary metastases is low. So the amount of data that's out there is limited. But with that suggestion, and when I think about what would I want to do, I would want to know as soon as possible if my cancer had started to spread and try to do something about it right away. We look primarily at two organ systems, liver and lung. Liver is the area of greatest focus. There are a lot of different ways to look at the liver. We can use MRI, we can use CAT scan, we can use ultrasound. There are different reasons to use different modalities. It's a very, I would say, individualized approach between you and either your ocular oncologist or your medical oncologist or maybe your primary care doc. I take care of patients who come, some from close by and some from very far away. So we're working in partnership with other docs who have various medical backgrounds. Sometimes it's a primary care doc who last heard about this disease in med school. And they say, tell me exactly what to do. And sometimes it's a patient who says, I want a cutaneous oncologist. And I say, gladly. And they're able to go. So that is an ongoing discussion. And it's not a boilerplate or a cookbook approach by any means. But if you do choose to undergo surveillance, it's worthwhile to look at both the liver and the lung, and you have to balance your risk of spread with the risk, the other issues that are related to some of these tests. How about risk of globe loss? We're doing pretty well here. So some people choose to have their eye out right away, and we still take out eyes. Typically it's larger tumors or tumors that have profoundly affected vision in eyes that have no useful prognosis for sight or where killing the tumor and still saving the eye will be a tremendous amount of work for the patient. One of the things that I try very, very hard to do, but which is very, very hard to do, is to explain to people what this roadmap will look like at the time of the diagnosis. So we've gone through all this testing. You've probably been there for hours. People are scared. They want to know, what do I have? And the answer is, I think you have uveal melanoma. For some people, that's the last thing that they hear. We have another hour worth of material for the ways that we treat this. It's really hard to get your head around all that's involved when you feel like it's time to make a decision quickly and decide how do we take care of this disease. And the path is very different. For those who've had their eye removed, single surgery, 
definitive local therapy, still needs to be followed for metastases, but that's it. It's in some ways very simple. Psychologically, it's a big deal. There's loss of a limb. We know from the COM study, though, that anxiety levels were actually a little bit lower for patients who had their eye removed because there's nothing else to do for that eye. And I think the concept of having all the cancer cells we can find cut out of the body still does resonate. But many people do still want to save their eye, and many people want to save their vision. And in fact, many people can save their vision, and they decide to undergo brachytherapy. Brachytherapy is the most widely used modality in the United States and in a lot of the developed world for treating this disease because many people can retain their eye and many of those still can retain their vision. And from the COM study we know, again, going out to that 12-year time point, 80% of people treated with brachytherapy were able to keep their eye. So 15% of, of people who underwent brachytherapy had a recurrence, and that's why their eye was removed. 5% had complications of radiation that were so bad they had to have the eye removed. So one out of five patients still lost their eye after brachytherapy. We're doing better than that now. There's a higher success rate, there's a higher local control rate. And I think one of the main reasons for that is this. Intraoperative ultrasound, which Peter talked about, most of us use that in the operating room. That was not required in the COM study. So the hard part of that surgery is making sure that this high-powered radioactive disc which is going to blast the daylights out of the tumor, but also anything else it's sitting next to, has to be exactly on top of the tumor and perfectly centered. And so most of the time that I spend in the OR is making sure that we have this plaque centered over the tumor. And now we're seeing success rates between 90 and 98%, depending on how long the data sets go out, in terms of local control rate or ability to save the globe. In terms of alternative therapies, it sounds like there's some familiarity with different modalities on this, and Pete covered this well. Um, I won't go into it in great detail. I wanted to put this slide in with the Aura study, just because we did get some very early preliminary data on this treatment method or this idea uh, this fall at one of our large uh, meetings. Currently, the study is in phase 1B2. There are only six patients that were reported with three and six month time points. This is something that's only useful for small tumors. So the idea is that something's injected into the eye. There, it's a virus vector. That virus infects the surface of the tumor. And there's an agent that's atta attached to it, the nanoparticle agent that's attached to it. Now we're trying to tag the tumor and then turn on the laser so that it selectively cooks just the tumor. Super cool concept. And the questions that I have are, will it penetrate the tumor deeply enough? Will we actually achieve kill of all the cells? And we don't know yet. And that's why we have to do these trials. In the initial data that Carol Shields reported this fall, there were some patients who had inflammation, which isn't too surprising when we inject particularly large particles in the eye. There were no major side effects related to it. There was one patient whose tumor progressed. That's all we know about this modality so far. Last issue, and the one that I spent a lot of time thinking about, is the risk of blindness and the prevention of vision loss. When I first heard about uveal melanoma, which is a disease that sort of found me, I didn't know I wanted to do this, but when I stumbled upon it, so much of it captivated me as an area where there's opportunity for huge amounts of progress. This was the most troubling slide that I could find in any textbook that I read. This is in the COM study, but half of patients in the COM study were legally blind three years after treatment. That does include patients who are already visually impaired, so some people have a tumor that grows in the macula they can't see to start with, but they still want to keep the eye. But nevertheless, for half of our patients to be blind, when all of us spend most of our waking hours trying to prevent blindness, we have room for improvement if this is the disease that we're going up against. And the COM study looked at, well, what are the risk factors for vision loss? Because there are some patients who get treated and they're still 20, 20 years later. And those factors are highly variable. They have a lot to do with what you start with. Unfortunately, you don't have any choice over that and neither do I. 
but the size of the tumor is a big deal. The bigger the tumor, the more energy that we have to put in it, the higher the radiation dose, and when there's more radiation put into the eye, there's usually more collateral damage. And then the location of the tumor. So tumors that are close to vital structures, like the optic nerve and the macula, they're going to have more side effects than a little tumor that's way out in the far periphery that's fairly easy to hit that doesn't burn a lot of vital structures. There are some other things that can uh, add to that risk. Folks with vascular disease are at higher risk. Folks who already have a detachment, a leaky detachment at baseline, who have a certain shape. We've looked amongst our own patient cohort at risk factors for vision loss from brachytherapy to try to understand who's going to have this problem or who has a high risk of this problem. If I can predict it on the front end to say, you know what, there's a decent chance that you'll be blinded by this treatment, do you still want the treatment? Some people still say yes. Because to us, when we say what we're using as criteria for blindness, it's 2200. Well, 2200 vision, I can still walk through this room and go over and get refreshments. And especially if I have something wrong with the other eye or I'm worried about something happening to the other eye, that still can be very, very useful vision. I'd like it to be a whole lot better. Total blindness, as Ken referred uh, and noted earlier, it's actually really, really rare with this. But what we're trying to do is stratify the risk for vision loss for folks so that they know what to expect. To the degree that we can, every one of us tries really hard to let you know what to expect with this disease. This is just some basic information about the folks um, that we reviewed. You can see we've got a pretty even gender balance. I don't yet know why we seem to have more left eyes than right eyes. You can see the class one, class two status, and this is fairly similar to most other groups' data set. Um, where about half of patients are class 1A and roughly 30% of patients are class 2. And then you can see the age distribution. And it is true that this is a disease mostly of middle age and later years, except when it isn't. And then we're all still scratching our heads about why this disease is still there, as shown in the, the really poignant um, comments from earlier uh, in the morning. So we broke out some of the risk factors, and I had a student who did an amazing job um, looking at um, a number of characteristics of this tumor to identify those things that put folks at risk for vision loss. And in the upper left table, there are some initial risk, risk factors. When we do a multivariate analysis on it, only two things stand out, the basal dimension and the dose of radiation to the macula. So the height dropped out. The reason for that is that the height is basically covered by the dose to the macula. If you have a tall tumor, there's a higher chance that we'll be sending a high dose of energy to the macula. And those were the two things. And one other statistical method that also proved to be relevant. What was very interesting to me was actually a useful number. Gray is the measurement of radiation that our radiation oncology folks use. They'll create a spatial model and plug that into their radiation planning software. And they give something called an isodose curve. Similar, Pete had a uh, demonstration of this as well. And basically, the radiation dose is falling off the farther away from the plaque that you get. The cool thing about I-125 and the reason that it was selected is that it delivers a lot of energy over a very short space. So radiation oncologists have lots of ways to use radiation to kill tumors and treat other diseases. Many of those involve passing a beam through the body. And you hope something important doesn't get hit along the way. Both proton beam and the isotopes used for brachytherapy were selected because the energy comes in and then it stops. And that's why we don't have complications in the brain. We don't have complications in the other eye. If you do have complications, they're relegated to the eyeball itself that was treated. What are some of those complications? I'm sure that many of you have experienced these either in the near term or potentially for the long term. I'll highlight just a few of the big ones here. Particularly in the first six to 12 months after treatment, many patients will have an irritated eye. Dry eye is worse. We happen to live in a terribly harsh climate here. This is a rough place to live with dry eye, even if you've never had brachytherapy. Often, this does get better over time, although it doesn't totally go away for every patient. Radiation cataract can be easily caused. It doesn't take a lot of radiation to cause a cataract. In fact, radiologists, when they do CAT scans at Children's Hospital or uh, any other peds hospital, they will actually arrange the CAT scanner if this is the lens so that the slices bypass the kid's lens. 
because a tiny amount of radiation can prompt a cataract in a kid. And if you're having brachytherapy and that plaque's anywhere close to your lens, you will get a cataract. I promise patients that. It happens to be a wonderfully solvable problem. And the COM study nicely showed that getting the cataract out is actually no different in brachytherapy patients than it is in patients who get a cataract for any other reason, aging, steroids. It's doable. Complication rate is the same. Um, and this is a visually restorative procedure. Neovascular glaucoma, thankfully, is fairly rare. The main reason that radiation hurts eyeballs is that it hurts blood vessels first. Blood vessels are one of the most sensitive tissues inside of the eye, much more sensitive, in fact, than the melanoma cells are. And so we know that our radiation will hurt blood vessels. And if those blood vessels happen to be on the iris, or it happens to be a broad swath of retina in the periphery, that eye will be starved for oxygen. The eye will start to form new blood vessels. And sometimes those blood vessels plug up drain holes inside the eye. Big amounts of bleeding can happen in the eye. A blind, painful eye can go on. And in the COM study, this is the reason that many people who had to have their eye out from radiation complications lost them. Thankfully, we don't see a lot of neovascular glaucoma from this disease anymore. And there are a few different reasons for that. The biggest one is that we now have great ways to find it before it really causes a problem, and we have great treatment for it as well. Some more uh, uncommon complications that can occur. Scleral necrosis is reported very rarely. Sometimes the plaque is a really high-dose plaque, and the wall of the eye can actually melt. All of us dread the possibility of that happening. It is blessedly rare. Double vision and strabismus is a terribly annoying problem. Many of my patients experience it in the short term, and some patients experience it in the long term. Some patients have to go on to have strabismus surgery, that is muscle surgery on the eye afterwards. That rate's quoted at about 5%. In most studies, this particular study cited here was lower. When I talk to folks who have different impacts of their vision from brachytherapy, people will complain much more bitterly about double vision than they will about blurry central vision. If it's a little fuzzy, I can live with that because I can ignore it. When there's two of you, it's twice as bad to come visit you in the office. <laughs> Droopy eyelids also, not uncommon. When we do surgery around the eye, and this is a pretty big surgery, we're manipulating the tissue. Contrary to popular belief, we don't pop it out on the cheek. It is kind of cool that we can get to every part of the eye that we need to just by rolling it over or lifting a muscle off. But the muscles that move your eyelid, especially your upper eyelid, are tiny. And it doesn't take much for that muscle to slide just a little bit. And so the eyelid can be droopier. Thankfully, that's also a solvable problem. Now we get to the real stuff, and the stuff that troubles me a lot, and the stuff that I would love to eradicate. And that's damage to the optic nerve and damage to the macula. These are two vital structures inside of the eye that you can't see without, um, though you can live without them. Radiation optic neuropathy, thankfully, is the rarer of the two. It's harder to kill nerves than it is blood vessels. We also have a lot more data from the radiation folks about killing nerves because they use radiation for other brain tumors. Meningioma is a common tumor. And so they know just about how much an optic nerve can take before it gets dinged, before it doesn't work. The other interesting thing to me about radiation optic neuropathy, which may show up with a swollen optic nerve, you can have a nerve that looks pretty bad and the patient still sees pretty well. They may have some area of vision that's fuzzy, a dark patch, or a generalized blurring or a loss of color vision, but it's hard to predict based on how the nerve looks what will happen to the vision. And many people who develop this subsequently show some resolution of it, and they move on down the road. If they haven't had too big a hit to the optic nerve, they can retain vision. Lastly, there's retinopathy and specifically maculopathy. The macula is the central part of your vision and it's got this fine lacy capillary net that is extraordinarily sensitive to a whole lot of things, but radiation is one of them. When retinopathy shows up in the far periphery, we can deal with that. We laser it, it's no big deal. We can do a vitrectomy if there's bleeding out there. That is solvable. If we wipe out the capillary bed in your central macula, you will suffer some loss of vision on that eye. And a lot of our efforts is focused on trying to avoid that central vision loss. Often it's not blindness, it's just a blurriness, if at all possible. 
The thing that's amazing about this, I put this angiogram in here just to give you an idea for what we're looking at. You know, this macula that you do all your critical central seeing with is only the central, maybe 10% of the retina. It's this area here. This patient's 20, 25 doing perfectly well with a huge tumor out here and about 40% of the retina totally wiped out by brachytherapy. That's what we want. We want to blast the tumor until it's gone. And this person's doing great. This is the ideal situation. We don't always have the luxury of the tumor being in that location, however. There are two aspects to macular damage that you may hear your doctors talk about if you had radiation. And we can do something about some of them and not do something about other ones. And this is what it looks like over time. This is a person who's 18 months out from treatment. This capillary network here in the macula still looks great. Vision still 20-25. 24 months out, we're starting to see a little bit of a moth-eaten appearance there, but it doesn't look too bad and the vision's good. Six months later, something's changed. You can see that there's capillary dropout in this area and there are big pockets of fluid or cysts. You'll hear the term macular edema. So macular edema, which is shown here, this we think we can do something about. Macular ischemia, or wipeout of the capillaries, I don't think we can do something about that. There's a little bit of debate about can we bring back some of these vessels and we may get a few of them back, but the truth is that cells have died here and when they're gone, we can't bring them back. Here there's some swelling and we can use medications that we put into the eye. You can see a before and after. Nice resolution there. Here's another example where there's a lot of swelling and now there's less swelling. There's been some loss of tissue. It doesn't look great. Vision is decent but this person's still going on with shots. And you all had a number of questions about shots, so I'll spend just a, a few of the remaining minutes here talking about these because I think this is a, a fairly hot topic um, for us and for you in terms of how we approach treating radiation retinopathy. You've already headed down the path of brachytherapy if you've chosen to keep the eye. Um, hopefully many of the post-op issues have resolved. Two to three years out, radiation retinopathy can start. Some people don't even realize it because they're so used to using the other eye. Others notice the vision starting to get fuzzy or dim or in low light, it's very hard to see. The question is, what do we do and when do we intervene? There's some debate amongst ocular oncologists about how much we can prevent this. I am of the mind that the only real way to prevent it is based on the way that we dose the radiation, where we put that plaque, how close it is to those vital structures, and how much total radiation that we use. There are some who think that after brachytherapy has been placed, if we start doing injections right away, maybe we're strengthening or preserving or somehow shoring up that capillary network that's there. That's an open question. We are starting to get a little bit of, de of uh, data on that. There's one group that believes fairly strongly in prophylactic treatment with anti-VEGF agents, and I believe they primarily use Avastin. For those who've had injections, who's had injections in the eye? Following brachytherapy. So this is a familiar conversation then to many of you. Um, I, I've never had a patient come in and say, you know, that was fun. Looking forward to seeing you next time. <laughs> now, as Pete alluded to, um, we do a lot of shots. And this disease I know is a rare one and it can feel like you're the only person in your town who has it, but if you start asking around about shots in the eyeball, you'll find good company <laughs> to discuss the good, the bad, and the ugly that goes with that. The, the meds that I've listed here have absolutely transformed our, our world, um, our field of, of vitro-retinal surgery because diseases like macular degeneration, diabetic macular edema, some other vascular diseases of the eye that used to be blinding and used to be awful now some of them are, are, are close to cured and patients can do incredibly well. To the question of, well, how long do I have to do this? I don't know the answer to that and it really depends upon the disease. So for macular degeneration, we know that the problem tends to come back and I, I do tell most of those patients you'll probably be on this for the rest of your life. But for diabetics, whose disease is the close, most closely related to radiation retinopathy, that may not be the case. And I have a lot of diabetic patients who need a whole lot of shots up front. And then we get their macular edema better and something about the disease does stabilize and we're able to either lengthen out shots or get them off of the shots. If you have a doc who's telling you that you may need to have injections and you're choosing to treat it to try to retain some vision from macular edema, 
it does not mean that you are committing to a lifetime of injections in the eye. We don't know what drugs we'll have available five years from now. We don't know how long that they will act. The reservoir that Pete talked about is incredibly exciting. Most people are willing to think of getting a shot once a year. Getting it every month, not all people are willing to do that. So we work with the tools that we have in the present day. We work with what we understand about the biology of this disease with the agents that we have available. As I mentioned, none of these are FDA approved for this problem. And so we're using them off-label. We're begging and we're pleading with insurance companies. We're trying to get free samples to be able to get you the drug. But we're able to do that in a number of instances. And what is really cool is to be able to make macular edema better, to have a person who has a scare that their vision is starting to go south because we knew it probably would, we predicted that, and to be able to pull them back. We don't usually pull it back to perfect, but if we can pull it back to pretty good, I'm pretty happy with that. And then my question is, can we sustain it? What I have learned in my own practice is that once radiation retinopathy gets bad, it is nearly impossible to catch up. And in terms of being able to use a picture to say that person won't see, we're getting a little better at that. It has to do with how big the cysts are and what kind of junk is in them. But if we can address the edema early on, I do believe that we can slow down the vision loss. Personally, I have found of the agents that are listed here, a Flibriceptor ILEA in my own practice has been very useful. It's also very expensive. It's also hard to get a hold of. We have done studies on the other agents that are listed here. We've had limited success with some of them. I am seeing a trend towards better outcome with the ILEA, and that is my preferred agent right now for people who have a tough case. For people who have an easy case, I'm going to use an easier drug to get a hold of. This is a long conversation with your doc. There's not a right answer. There's absolutely no consensus amongst ocular oncologists. If you haven't noticed, for those who've had second, third, fourth opinions throughout the course of this disease, you may have picked up on the fact that ocular oncologists don't agree on a whole lot of things. So when we do get a win and we're able to save the eye, or we do get a win and a person's able to have stable long-term vision, that is a big deal to me. It's a lot of work for you. A whole lot of work. And we try to project that for p folks who are deciding on brachytherapy that, you know, you're, we're going to be stuck working together for quite a while. So let's make sure we think that through on the front end. But I think many people find that to be worthwhile. Not everyone does. Some people change their mind. They want to change treatment. Some will just say, hey, I'm worn out on this whole thing. That's also okay, too. I think whenever there's transparency in the conversation and the relationship, I think that's when it can be its strongest. I think I'll stop there. We're out of time. Um, it's great to be with you this morning. Thanks very much.